Um, I'm delighted now to introduce the chair of our next session, who is Vincenzo Bolettino. Uh, Enzo, as we call him, is <coughs> excuse me, the executive director of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Um, Harvard has many human rights programs and entities. We also have a humanitarian initiative, which is very uh, active and very actively involved in the field in dealing with um, emergencies and disasters and uh, post-conflict and post-conflict situations. And of course, for HHI, um, issues of identification are critical, uh, both for rescue and uh, in emergency intervention uh, um, purposes, but also then for supporting displaced populations and uh, understanding the mechanics of humanitarian reunification and so on. So we're delighted to have them as, as partners in this, uh, in this meeting. So Enzo, thank you for chairing the next panel. Jackie, thank you so much for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Enzo Bolatino, and it is uh, my pleasure uh, to uh, invite the panel today to discuss uh, government data. Uh, we have three speakers today, uh, Deborah Rose, Joanne Barnhart, and Ryan Seals. Uh, I'll introduce our first speaker now, Deborah Rose. Uh, Dr. Rose is a visiting scholar at the FXB Center. Uh, she's a chronic disease epidemiologist with interest in psychological epidemiology, demography, environmental health, and sustainable development. She's also spent over 20 years designing and analyzing data from the U.S. National Health Interview Survey, focusing on the 1990 health objectives. Uh, she was also the first to advise the National Health, it, health Interview Survey of Mexico, asking Mexican women about uh, breast cancer screening practices. And she's uh, received her uh, PhD from Yale University. Uh, Dr. Rose, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to see you all here. I'm going to thank a few people I haven't thanked before because um, it will establish some credentials in areas that it looks like I don't have, um, such as the India Aadhaar number system. Um, uh, um, Rick Levin, former president of Yale, introduced, was one of two people, along with Tom Gibby and um, um, Center for Global Development, who introduced me to Nandan, who I hope will be here virtually. Um, Rajesh Bansal, who was the second head of the UIDAI agency in India, was very generous with his time when he had a report due to the new Prime Minister Modi, who decided to keep the system. And Mark Lockie, who nobody's mentioned, but um, hosts Connect ID every year, which is um, an ID conference of mainly vendors, but that's and we do have a few vendors here, and he has been most generous with getting allowing me to access many of the panelists who I otherwise wouldn't have met or been able to get uh, contact in contact with. So I just want to thank these people for um, making this possible. I thought I would try to give an outline to make this more focused. So civic identity is a basic human right. Three types of data sets my definition of a formal data set, what is a number, another thing about Hindu-Arabic numbers, and what makes a good national ID number. Civic identity is a basic human right. Um, many of the other speakers have mentioned this. As recently as September 2015, um, the, the Sustainable Development Goal mentioned this, so we're all very pleased it um, validates what we do. Um, this is my own definition, it's not technical. Parts of it will be very technical, but um, a lot of people talk about data and they don't necessarily know what it looks like. Um, so actually, I forgot to mention another person, um, Jan Stolwick, former dean of the School of Public Health at Yale, who allowed me, instead of finishing my thesis on time, uh, to teach, to write a textbook and teach a data management course, some of which, um, will be inserted into these slides to show you what data actually looks like. Um, dynamic databases and formal rectangular data sets. I tried taking an online data science course and was dismayed at what they called data. 
Okay, amorphous data comes from many sources. It's not created all at once. And if I'm wrong, it's okay. This is my view of it. Um, it can be, it's basically what's, um, it can be derived from commercial transactions, web searches, buying patterns, weather patterns, generally generated for a purpose other than analysis. It doesn't target individuals. It has to be aggregated before analysis. There are new techniques and special software that do that. It's called distributed computing. The trendy term for these data sets is big data, but um, some of us who worked with large government data sets consider that to be big data too. It's just completely different. Um, dynamic databases, um, that's when the database is used for a particular purpose. Um, it actually does have an individual record that is searchable. So um, something like a social security database, um, any uh, a, a record of um, your state um, driver's license, all of those things are used on a daily basis live. They are not really analyzable. They need to be frozen and, and a data set extracted if you're going to analyze them. Um, but th those are the original reasons for these data sets to be um, built and maintained. A formal rectangular data set, I'm old fashioned enough to still think this is important, um, for one that contains about people, some information about people, a row represents a person, I would also call it a unit of analysis, a column or a group of columns is a variable. The format is documented in something called a code book, which lists the variable name, label, the values it can take, the labels for its value. It may list some other attributes. Um, federal data sets can be generated by a population census, such as the U.S. Census, or by one of the many sample surveys. Um, people don't realize there's a whole other part of the Census Bureau that fields many surveys for other agencies, as well as its own. A university researcher, of course, can develop his or her own data set. They're usually smaller than government data sets. Um, data can be extracted from a dynamic data set and frozen as a cross-sectional cross slice um, that can be analyzed. And then um, in the US government, there are public use data sets that are created that can be analyzed, but they are very form carefully formulated and in some case, the data is a little bit disturbed to protect the privacy of individuals. And I don't know to what extent other countries also have a public use data set um, ability. I believe Mexico does, but I wasn't able to get the data set for the, um, the survey that I advised them on. Um, in the US, we have what are called principal statistical agencies. There are at least 13 that are designated as such. I have highlighted the National Center for Health Statistics, which is where I worked and the Office of Research Evaluation and Statistics, which is part of the Social Security Administration, and you will be hearing from Joanne Barnhart about that. Um, there is a huge list of, several lists of principles, but they are committed to scientific integrity, a common set of professional standards and operational practices designed to ensure the quality, integrity, and credibility of their statistical activities. There's also a whole separate section on independence the independence of the data collection part of the agency from any policy making part of the agency so that the data is independent and unbiased. Um, entering data into a formal rectangular data set, it can be entered through special laptop interview software called SCAPI or a specialized data entry piece of software where range and value checks are the minimum. There also may be algorithms to check for internal consistency, including age, sex, answers to previous questions. A demographic check variable, for instance, on sex would prevent a woman from being even asked about prostate cancer screening tests or prevent a child from being asked about the number of pregnancies she's had. I do not uh, recommend manually entering data into an Excel spreadsheet as a good way to create a large formal data rectangular data set. This was recommended in an unnamed MOOC course I just tried to take recently. There are too many sources of error and the file format is proprietary. Cleaning a formal data set. 
They may be cleaned at the record level during data entry or at the batch level using extensive computational operations, which may include range checks, value checks, the application of decision logic tables to account for all possible combinations of answers between adjoining variables. The result is an internally consistent data set that's ready to analyze. Um, I'm just giving age as an example here because it's not as defined as those of us born in this country with birth certificates might think. Um, in, in many, for many underserved populations, and there are people like that in the United States too, including migrants or people who are undocumented, um, it's not exactly clear what the age might be. Also in some countries, um, the age of your baptism uh, is counted as your age rather than your actual birth date. Um, a person in, in the survey that I was involved with could be asked for both date of birth and current age kind of as a check. Or if there isn't, if you don't know the age, there, there can be a series of life events to estimate age. Computing algorithms can produce a simple, consistent age for use in a dynamic database because you have to come to some conclusion or for analysis. And estimation of age is something needed, for instance, in India when going backwards and creating a birth certificate to someone who is getting an Aadhaar <coughs> number. Um, so um, again, the people involved with that can talk more about that, but that is a part. It's separate, but it is an ancillary part, I believe, of that program. Um, analyzing a formal data set, it can be descriptive to test a hypothesis or develop a model to estimate relationships and events in other existing data sets or to predict the results in new data sets still to be collected. With a codebook and a selection of statistical procedures, a formal rectangular data set can be analyzed using a standard statistical package such as SAS or SPSS. Again, not only from the course I took, but from speaking with someone um, from my former agency, R and other software packages that attempt to load a whole file into RAM that cannot handle the size of a large government data set, which contain, contain over 100 people or thousands of variables, is not what I consider a tool to analyze this kind of data set. Okay, here is looking inside a data set, for those of you who may not have seen one. Uh, I have simplified this, I have made it easier to look at by putting blanks, blank columns in between the variables just so you can separate them out. In an actual data set, the code book will define the columns so you don't need that. And for anybody who is interested in this, I used a random gen a number generator generated table to generate the first 11 digits of the ID number here. And I used a check digit deg um, generator to generate the check digit. So, these, um, these, are ID, these actually could be used as randomized ID numbers. Um, this is an example of the code book for that data set. Sorry. Um, so I just picked it as um, you would actually use the first 12 digits as one variable, not two. Birth year, notice it has four digits. Birth month and then birth day. Um, I noticed the Kenitalia number was the other order, and um, for most computer operations, you'd want to search in the year, month, day order. Um, sex, um, we still have male and female, but I believe India now has another option. And then I've put in last name and first name just to give examples of character data. Um, what is a merged file or joined file? Um, people have kind of talked around that issue of keeping information separate, um, whether it all should be in a central database, I mean people on these panels, or whether it should be kept in separate, separate data sets and data agencies even. So I'm going to go through what a merge is. So this is a way of explaining how the data can be separate and how it can be combined. And again, this is and inside the file view for those of you who might not have seen data before. Um, and again, this is my own classification. Uh, it might differ from everybody else's. Um, a one-step match merge between two files uh, when the matching variable or say the ID 
in our case, in this country, it would be social security number, exists in both files, or a relational join where the data sets do not contain a common ID, but there's a third file, a crosswalk, that contains both ID variables and would be used in a two-step merge. So here's an example of a one-step merge. File one on the left, I've said, is an ID number file, and that follows um, what I showed earlier. File two would be a bank file, and that was the first app used in India after the Aadhaar number was developed. And file three would be how they got merged together. Now, something I hadn't originally thought about until I started putting this together is people might not be in both places. So there has to be a decision made. Do you keep all of the records or just the merged records? And probably you should keep all of them, and then you could either discuss the whole population or do a subset of just the merged ones. But this is how the data actually can be joined together. <coughs> Uh, a two-step relational merge, here the um, original files would be the ID info file and, say, a tax file. And in this situation, um, I'm assuming that the tax ID number is separate from the, ID, the, the national ID number. So you need a crosswalk file that does combine the two. So were you to be worried about security, you would probably be most worried about file two, but it doesn't have all of the details that either the demographic details that file one has or the, the tax or other financial data information that file three has. So what you would do is merge file one with file two, which is the ID and demographic data with a crosswalk file. Then you merge that merged file with file four. Uh, with, okay, so you, you, re, you re, Sorry, you, you merge file one and file two and you get the crosswalk file with the demographic data merged in. Then you would merge that file with a tax file and you would get file five, which is the one that you analyze. Um, if that is kept separate from all the other files, again, you still don't have all the data in one place. Um, you do maintain privacy. Uh, why, that should be wire files needed. Uh, it allows you to keep different kinds of data stored separately, increase privacy and security, but you can combine them for analysis or you know, whatever the legitimate uses are. Okay, what can you do with a numeric ID number? You can keep different kinds of data in different files. You could have different kinds of ID numbers for different kinds of files. You would only need to store pairs of ID numbers in separate transactional files, and you could merge the different data sets to combine information only as needed and only with proper authority. And the skeptics among us always doubt the proper authority. I worked for the federal government for over 20 years, and I like to believe that this is done properly. Okay, what is a number? Um, this, this may seem a little... Um, of a digression, but ultimately um, I think it's relevant. These are what we call Arabic numerals, which I've discovered are called Hindu Arabic numerals, and they are central to my understanding of computations. Uh, the history is that um, they were developed in India, they, they spread to Arab countries, and Leonardo Fibonacci first brought the concept to Europe in about 1202. The Babylonians were the first to develop a true place number system. Even though the Romans did a lot of engineering, it was kind <coughs> of seat of the pants. It's really hard to do calculations with Roman numerals. Uh, <laughs> I, I really fell in love with the idea of numbers, and friends were surprised that I discovered that I like numbers at this late stage. But anyway, I really like the actual numbers. Okay, the concept of zero we take for granted, but it was developed independently in at least three civilizations, the Babylonians, the Mayans, and the Indians, first as a placeholder, then as a number in its own right. But division by zero was a sophisticated concept not understood until calculus was developed by Newton and Leibniz. Here are the computer codes for Hindu Arabic numerals. And this is either ASCII, it's now part of ISO, whatever level it's up to. 
the bits and bytes, everything electronic goes into, um, I guess I'm doing 8-bit um, combinations. The hexadecimal code you can see goes from 30 to 39, but the glyph is, is retained, and in the latest international standards, they still retain the 0 to 9 um, crosswalk to, to have things <coughs> at least consistent um, since... I guess 1968 is when ASCII was developed. Um, okay, so what is this? Um, I found this in that August journal, Wikipedia. Uh, do, oh, does anyone, does anyone know what this is? This is a telephone keyboard. I don't know if it's for a cell phone or not. Um, it's Arabic, it's in Arabic, it's, this one is Egyptian and Again, what I've been calling Arabic numerals, or have been taught to call Arabic numerals, are really Western Arabic numerals, so they're on the left, and Eastern Arabic numerals, which are actually in Arabic, are on the right. I was hoping Joseph would be here and, and help me out with this. Um, so why am I, and this came from a conversation with Joseph that I maybe misinterpreted and wrote a little paper on, but anyway, he's here to agree or disagree however he wishes. Um, why well, propose including a Hindu Arabic ID number field in all national identification systems? Well, partly because I read English and Spanish and I could read it, but anyway. It avoids the need to convert between languages with non-Roman scripts in English. Arabic numerals and their ASCII ISO codes can be read and manipulated by all programming languages and data systems. It's easy to program a data set merge and other file operations using Hindu Arabic numerals. Biometric data requires that each person have two eyes, ten fingerprints, which is not always possible. Also, there's a social class <clears throat> difference and an age difference as to whether you can produce a fingerprint. Um, and for a range of reasons, everyone can be assigned a number. Even though facial recognition images, which Joseph knows something about having invented them, and digital fingerprints can be converted to numbers, and I've left out, um, there are algorithms that can do that. Um, it's simpler to use a number in the first place. What makes a good national ID number? These are my personal views. Um, each country should make a national ID number available to all residents, the way the Adahar program does in India. And I'm glad people have already emphasized it's residents, not um, citizens. Uh, especially if you're going to use it for sustainable development, you want to reach the people most in need and those are the people who are undocumented in many different ways. Um, I think identification numbers should be numeric for all the reasons I said I really like Hindu Arabic numerals. Um, uh, I, Ian was one of the first, Ian's paper was one of the first that I found when I started looking into ID numbers. I still find the Scandinavian example, the, uh, the Icelandic example, fascinating and people have said, well, how do you not have security problems? Maybe because it's small, but it's also such an open system. But um, what that system does is certainly embeds personally identifiable information within the national ID. That would never cut it in um, a common law country such as the US or Great Britain. Um, so if you're going to put PII, personally identifiable information, in your ID, please use four digits for year of birth and drop any codes for male or female. Um, we had what was called the year 2000 bug. I don't understand why people who are otherwise logical hadn't seen that coming. But in, scan in countries that use a two-digit birth year, you have 102-year-olds asked to register for kindergarten, which is you know, kind of not really um, what you want. In terms of sex, some of the original countries coded females uh, because probably they started when computers were less capable and you used uh, assembler and you squeezed as much into as small an area as you could. Instead of saying one equals male and two equals female, you took birth month and added 50 and that made you female. Or if you were female, that's how it was coded. I don't think we need to do that anymore. Um, that I see is also not treating women equally. Um, so uh, update any system that has something like that. Do not code race, ethnicity, or religion into the identification number 
and don't put them on any identity card. We will have other people, such as Edwin Black, talking about that later. Um, I had wanted to have someone talk about the Egyptian Baha'i community, which is hugely discriminated against. Um, that didn't happen, but hopefully we can get a paper from him anyway. Um, we're feasible. I think I'm in favor of using different numbers for different purposes rather than one omnibus number. The, the Social Security number in the US has had function creep. It's used for, it makes sense if it's used for Social Security benefits. I can see it spreading to tax, but for other thing, no. I am a, a retired member of the US Public Health Service, which is a uniform service. If any of my family members are in the hospital, even though it's not supposed to happen, it is my social security number splattered across the, the medical screen in each room because I'm the sponsor. And because we don't have the protections and we don't like having our social security numbers all over the place, I'm not happy with that. Um, I champion the ID number. I'm agnostic as to whether or not to require or even issue a national identity card. I would like to say that um, I guess I've now met four of the previous chair, including the founding chair of the UIGAI agency, which um, assigns the Adahar number. And there is something that you can print out on your computer and can laminate with your own plastic pa contact paper that looks like a card that even though three of the um, chairs deny that it exists, Nandan showed me his, there are times in which people with eyes want to just see the card, not just have you give your fingerprints or your number. Having been in India a couple of times, there are times where there's no electricity and you may or may not be able to do all that with the machines. Um, there is somebody in the audience who told me, yes, she's just spent the summer in India and everybody does carry what looks like a card, whether or not that's an official card. And the, uh, I will, again, give a lot of credit to Julio Frank for helping me think about this. When I was all excited, we were on a trip to Botswana and he started talking to me about his five different ID numbers and showing me his four different cards, and I realized this was something much more complex than on anything I knew about. The point that may seem obvious, but nobody's quite mentioned about a voter ID number is you have to be a certain age, probably 18. You have to be a citizen. It doesn't cover you up until age 18. A lot happens in your life before then. So it's hard for, I, I can understand because I've been told that in Mexico it's an important number and we have Robert saying that it competes with the, the adoption of the national ID number, but it's hard for me to understand what to do for non-citizens and people younger than 18 who are not going to have a voter ID number. Thank you. <laughs> oh, wait, uh, wait a minute, maybe I think I, oh, final thought, okay. Um, I'd like us to think about those who are at risk wherever they may be and to work toward a world in which national identification systems will be used only for good and not evil. Dr. Rose, thank you so much. Um, I, for one, will certainly be very careful um, and cognizant of uh, my use of the term data. Uh, I also am, uh, was really pleased to have a bit of a, a primer on the history of numbers, uh, which I was completely unaware of, so thank you so much. Uh, next up, uh, we have Joanne Barnhart. Uh, Ms. Barnhart is an adjunct lecturer at the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, she's taught a course there for the past eight years called Designing Social Security Systems. Uh, she served as a commissioner of, the social, of social Security for the U.S. Uh, from 2001 to 2007. And prior to that, she served for more than four years as a member of the Social Security Advisory Board. Uh, please welcome uh, Joanne Barnhart. Thank you, Enzo. I want to start by saying that I'm really delighted to be here to be part of this conference. And I want to commend Dr. Rose um, for bringing such interesting and diverse perspectives together to discuss the issue. We spent quite a bit of time together, and she definitely lived up to her promise to, bring, um, to make sure there was going to be lively discussion and debate. And I strongly support that. And for that reason, promise you I'm going to keep my remarks brief to set the stage, hopefully help set the stage for questions and discussion of issues. Um, I'm gonna talk about four 
separate areas, focus my remarks on four things, cross-matching program data, confidentiality of data, creep, what I call creep, and cost-benefit analysis of a national ID. For those of you who are looking at the screen, the system is not broken. Um, I use what Dr. Whiteley would probably describe as a federated approach to my technology at home. <laughs> I, have, um, I have a Blackberry, an iPad, um, a PC netbook, an Apple iPro, and a desktop that's, I think, Windows 6 or 7, 5, whatever it was. Anyway, point is, I have, although I have all this technology, I've not yet gotten in the habit of doing PowerPoint. And in fact, it didn't even occur to me, never does, to do a PowerPoint anything until someone says, do you want to send us your PowerPoint so we can put it in the system? Please keep in mind, as I look around this audience, I think I got several decade head start on most of you in my career. When I started working, we were still typing triplicate covers with carbon paper. And fortunately, we considered the IBM Selectric an absolute just masterful invention. And uh, I, I witnessed the, the, um, the development of the copy machine, the fax machine, the pager. So anyway, so be it. Not technology oriented when it comes to, to giving remarks. So that said, um, first, cross-matching program data. Having run large federal agencies, I am very much aware of the need for comprehensive data to ensure that program goals are being met, um, to track individual case records, and to be able to aggregate data to perform cross-program analysis. I have also personally experienced in those positions the frustration of not being able to do cross-program data matches even within the same agency. At one point, um, uh, prior to my social security involvement, I, I uh, was running the nation's welfare and cash assistance programs and human services programs, and I w naturally wanted to do a match between Head Start and cash assistance and some other programs to see if we were using a holistic approach to, to provide benefits and services to these families and was told can't do it. There's no way to match the files. Um, so I've seen that within the same agency. And let me just tell you, when you move beyond your agency to another agency, like when I wanted to try to match unemployment data with the number of people who were on the welfare rolls and people who were involved in work programs, absolutely impossible to do as well, even more impossible than it was to do in the same agency. Um, th now, this, this difficulty of doing the cross-program data matches is really twofold. Um, first, more often than not, the individual programs have their own individual identifiers. And although the social security number is always part of the record, as Deborah mentioned, um, the fact is it's generally not necessarily the identifier. They have a case identifier, and those are not the same. They're different for every single program and within every agency. Um, so that's a problem. A national ID, obviously, if used as an identifier across all programs, would eliminate that problem. It would eliminate the difficulty of being able to take files from one program, one from another, put them together and see where there's overlap. But second, um, the second issue is the data systems themselves create enormous challenges. I remember when I first went to Social Security, I heard for the first time the term legacy systems. Now, for me, <laughs> legacy, I should say I was an English major in college. For me, <laughs> legacy connoted value, something should be valued and esteemed, you know, I mean, it just had this, <laughs> I could, I, from your laughter, you know, I could not have been more wrong. Um, in fact, I, I found out that the term legacy system is really more or less a euphemism for dinosaur-like computer programs that make it virtually impossible to do cross-matching at all. They lack the nimbleness and the flexibility of our newer computer processing programs. And in fact, they're not compatible with each other, let alone the new programs. Um, and, and, it, and it's a huge, huge problem. At Social Security, many of our, our computer processing was done on COBOL, in, in COBOL, for example, COBOL code. And we actually had a unit of staff, and I assume they still do today, um, where we taught graduating technology students coming into the agency how to do COBOL programming, because no one even had heard of it, basically, let alone knows how to do it. But in order to run some of our systems, you had to be able to do that. Um, so, so, um, so even with a common ID, the issue of cross-program matching is not solved 
because of the issue with our legacy, so-called legacy systems. Now, sadly, these systems permeate the federal government. Social Security has no, no claim uh, to that problem alone. And it would require, based on the probing that I did when I was at Social Security, and I'm sure it's still the case, it would require decades of time and cost literally hundreds of billions of dollars to replace those systems. So this is a huge issue that would need to be addressed to help this cross-program matching, unless, if, if, unless, of course, you were starting all over from you know, day one to just use certain kinds of systems with a national number. Second general focus, uh, data confidentiality. Now, with the ability to collect data also comes the, a re very real responsibility to safeguard it. Some of our earlier panelists spoke to that issue. Um, at Social Security, data gathering, maintenance, access, and use is a very serious business. SSA records contain personal, financial, and in the case of disability files, um, personal health information that the public entrusts to the government to safeguard. Um, we also collect wage data for all employees from employers. Social Security has direct links to IRS. In fact, IRS actually issues the checks to the beneficiaries for Social Security. So an unwarranted and definitely an illegal entry or use, you know, entry into or use of that data system can have really dire consequences for the lives of individuals and for the integrity of the Social Security Administration. This is really important, obviously, because Social Security is the one government program that literally touches the lives of everyone in this nation in one way or another. And it's very important, and we took, we took it very seriously um, to make sure that people trusted Social Security, saw it as a reliable, responsible federal agency. Um, we all know that identity theft is a real and growing problem, particularly with the increase in online banking, bill paying, and purchasing. And a Social Security number can provide the pathway um, to identity theft. Um, someone, one of our earlier panelists re referred to it, I think, as sort of a half-secret number. You know, it's, it's your, I, I believe, yes, you did. Uh, it, it's, it's a number that's supposed to be only related to Social Security, and we're not supposed to talk about it, but on the other hand, everybody asks about it. And we've all experienced that countless times, where doctors, hospitals, department stores, specialty stores, um, universities, just about any institution that you can possibly think of um, ask for your social security number, although it was never intended to be an identification number. FYI, one of the privileges I assert as a former commissioner is when some department store place asks me for my social security number, I immediately say, why do you need that? And then they, they say, well, everybody gives it to it. I go, well, I don't, because I'm the former commissioner of social security, which I never invoke that title. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. And nobody else should be either. And then all the people in the line kind of go, oh, wow, we shouldn't be giving the number. Anyway, um, so, you know, just a little bit of public protest there on my, on my part. I do um, <laughs> Anyway, on that point of social security not being a national number, because it has so permeated everything in American society relative to identity or information proving who you are. While I was at Social Security, I often said that the only people in America who believe that the Social Security number is not a ident national identification number work at the Social Security <laughs> Administration. And I say that with great affection because they're wonderful people, but they absolutely continue to espouse, espouse that, that belief. And it is true according to the law. But that's also why I almost never gave a speech as commissioner without admonishing the audience to stop carrying their social security cards in their wallets. How many of you have your social security card in your wallet? Nobody's gonna put their hand up here, but usually people go like this when I ask, yes, see, stop it, stop it. Um, it's why one of my first initiatives as commissioner of social security was to issue regulations <laughs> prohibiting states from using social security numbers on their driver's license as driver's license numbers. Um, to keep that number out of, you know, how many times you present, prevent, present your driver's license to keep the social security number out of the public domain, so to speak. Now, interesting though, I'm saying this on behalf of Social Security, a large government agency, and despite this concern, Medicare, despite requests from myself, and continues to issue the Medicare card, which has your Medicare number, which is, guess what, your Social Security number. 
and I'm saying don't carry your Social Security card, and how many Medicare beneficiaries do you think would dare leave home without the Medicare card in tow, right? So we have some issues there, different perspectives within our own federal government. I will also say that as one of the millions of current and former federal employees, the OPM.gov, um, whose personal data was part of that OPM breach, um, the issue hit very close for me. It's one thing to talk about it, it's another to experience it. Um, and it made me even more sensitive to the responsibility to safeguard personal information and data. I will say since that breach, my email's been hacked, I've had two credit cards compromised, I got a fraud alert on my mother's bank accounts. She's over 90 and I'm the signatory for her accounts. And two days ago, while I was in fact dealing with the health crisis of my 90-year-old mother, I found out um, from my bank, the United States Senate Federal Credit Union, that someone was vacationing in Cancun on my debit card. So um, anyway, point is, I'm not saying there's a, there's a direct correlation. I can't say cause and effect. I can simply say, as a good data person, I can't say that. Um, I can say that in my head, though, since I never had those problems before. Um, third issue, creep. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm looking around. There might be a few of you here who are old enough. Um, but for those of you who are old enough to remember Watergate, I'm not talking about the committee to reelect the president, just to be clear. <laughs> what I am talking about is the inevitable expansion of data collection, comparisons, and aggregations that will flow and multiply simply because a national ID removes many of the existing hurdles and makes it easier to get data. And I'm sure every person in this room would agree that for a policy person, there is no greater drive than the drive for more data. In my experience in the public policy arena, data is the stuff dreams are made of. And I have to say, I am as guilty as anyone, so I don't say this as a criticism, simply as a reflection of what I believe is the absolute fact. Um, so we have to recognize that the, that the obligation will come with the ability to develop and analyze data without hurdles. Program administrators, academicians must resist the urge to develop unnecessary data reports ju just because the data is there. Um, but creep possibilities don't end there. With a national ID number, will we'll come, at least I can tell you, in the United States, a push for a national ID card. I say this with certainty because when I was commissioner, the push for changing the social security card um, to make it an ID card was already underway. And as a program administrator, I would be remiss if I didn't at least pay uh, take a few minutes to address the practical issues that come into play with any kind of national ID card. First of all, it would probably require a photograph. Since Social Security enumeration occurs at birth before most babies leave the hospital, I can only assume enumeration for a national ID would also begin at birth. At what age does the ID photograph begin? How often would a new photograph be required? After all, believe it or not, I look a lot different now than I did at 16 or even at age 50. The point is, at what yearly increments would we have to redo those photos? So at Social Security, because of the questions and pressure I was getting from members of the US Congress and Senate, uh, we calculated the cost of, of photographic equipment, the manpower that would be required to update photographs. We used every five years, because at that time, that's what most state driver's licenses were using on the average five years. And the cost of issuing and reissuing each new rendi rendition of the photo ID card. And this is, by the way, without any kind of biometrics, without any thumbprint or anything like that. The cost was a staggering $9 billion a year. And we already had the physical infrastructure with 1,500 field offices across the nation. To put that $9 billion in context for you, the, operate, the annual operating budget for the Social Security Administration, which at that time had 87,000 employees, 1,500 field offices, and 120 field offices, not to mention several dozen people based abroad to provide services to Americans overseas. Our annual operating cost was $9 billion a year. So we were basically talking about doubling the cost of the Social Security Administration's administrative budget. Another creep possibility is directly related to the NSA surveillance issue that arose a few years ago. 
Um, with a national ID, tracking personal information is much easier. If the ID is, ID is used for credit card applications, bank accounts, it would be possible to track travel when you go on Expedia, you know, if your credit card's purchasing it. Um, all your purchases, you guys get the idea. It's a, it's a lot more than just cookies on your computer that follow the fact that you were looking at the West Elm ad, you know, last night for a new sofa. Um, now, how does this relate to data? Well, we heard, from, we heard the term megadata, right? We turned the her, heard the term megadata so many times that everyone from reporters to individuals started using it like it was a household word. My guess is that most people, including the reporters, would be hard pressed to give you a definition or even begin to explain what megadata is. But we all talk about it now, like we know what it is. My point is a certain amount of public education um, about data gathering, usage, and limitations with a national ID would need to be done. And whatever limitations are set, they must be adhered to in order for citizens to entrust the government with the ability, even if with not the authority to use for all those purposes, but just the ability to access personal information and data. Specifically, uh, concerns regarding the possibility of a national database must be addressed. And fourth, CBA or cost-benefit analysis. I don't use CBA in the traditional sense when I talk about it, like not meaning dollars and cents. Um, rather, I use it replacing cost with risk and benefits with advantages. We need only look at the Real ID Act and what's happened here since its passage in 2005 to get an idea of the skepticism of, for anything that hints of a national ID and genders, the headlines, again, that I believe you had in your lovely PowerPoint presentation. Um, passed in 2005 to establish standards that state driver's licenses must adhere to in order to be accepted for federal ID purposes. As of last month, 23 states and territories are compliant, 31 have been granted extensions, and two are non-compliant. In that intervening time from 2005 to now, it's 16 or 17 states even passed laws rejecting the real ID, and there have been several court cases. Now, I would like to point out that obviously that's a bit different than establishing a national ID number because state driver, driver's licenses are, are normally within the purview of the state. So some of these court cases and some of the objection is the idea that the federal government is, is sort of, um, you know, sticking its nose into the state's business. But I do believe there's some analogous points that need to be looked at. Um, the main point is this is an example of what happens when the focus is solely on the risks and no public explanation of advantages has been provided because I would submit that is what has happened with the Real ID Act. So as, as we explore, consider, and discuss establishing a national ID, policy, I believe, policy practitioners must prove to the public and to lawmakers that the advantages far outweigh the risks. That kind of CBA is clearly a tall order, but I would submit that it's incumbent on any policy that has the potential to subject the American public to additional risk to first prove that the potential gains make it a risk worth taking. Thank you. Ms. Barnhart, thanks so much for uh, uh, a marvelous uh, presentation and some sage insights and advice. I can't help but to offer a couple of anecdotes in terms of my own experience with the Social Security number. Uh, the first is that I, I took the advice of not carrying my card, which I had carried for years. Um, and regrettably, I realize I'm in the end of one. Um, I had the card hidden in my apartment, which was robbed, and they took my Social Security card. Um, <laughs> So um, that, that, that's sad. It, I've also found it can be socially disruptive. Um, there was someone out there at some point who had um, my wife's social security number but one digit in reverse and who owed child support. So you can imagine my surprise um, when well before having children, I received a letter saying that my wife uh, owed child support, um, which went on for years. Um, so I'm all in favor of protecting social security numbers. I think it's a great idea. Um, our ne next up, we have Ryan Seals, uh, who's a postdoctoral research fellow at the Department of Epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. 
Uh, he, his research focuses on environmental and occupational risk factors for neurodegenerative disorders and on methods for making stronger causal inferences from observational studies. Brian. Uh, Thank you. I think I should have titled this uh, a case study in creep, um, <laughs> uh, because basically that is, I think, uh, how we've made use of all these Danish registries. Um, but uh, I think a, a little bit different than a lot of the presentations yesterday and today, and presumably tomorrow, this is going to be more sort of a case study or an example of the kind of scientific study one could do based on the data that are available, primarily because of these identification numbers, but also the kinds of registries that those numbers allow us to link together. Uh, and so we did these in the Danish registries. Uh, so a little background, uh, a little bit of an outline. I'll try and do a short background. I'm, I tried to make this as, as, l as less of a, an epidemiologic presentation as possible and focus on the data sources and how we use them. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about why we were doing these re this research in the first place. Um, and then, for the most part, talk about the information that exists in the Danish registries, which is what we used to perform this research. Uh, and then I'll briefly go through a detailed example of how, uh, of what specific, a specific kind of scientific question that we wanted to answer uh, using these kinds of data. Uh, so again, this is sort of the typical background that I would give for a scientific presentation. Uh, the study we were trying to do, right, was look for risk factors for ALS. So I think most people are probably familiar with what ALS is, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, especially after the uh, ice bucket challenge of last year. More and more people know. Uh, it's uh, fairly rare, luckily, uh, but also rapidly fatal. Right? So about two to three people per 100,000 per year are expected to get this disease. Uh, that translates, because it's such a short-lived uh, disease, to only about 6,000 cases in the entire US per year. Right, so quite rare, which is, as I'll talk about, one of the benefits of using national registries and national ID numbers to do this kind of research. Um, and, well, we can ignore that bottom part except to say that there are a lot of potential risk factors, but very little is known about it because of uh, some of the issues I'll talk about, the fact that it's rare and very short-acting disease. Uh, and, again, this is sort of a similar kind of slide. The, thing, the, the only two things that we know about the disease are that age causes it and a few genes cause it. Everything else is suspected because all of the studies that have been used to try and prove these things are either small or have serious epidemiologic problems that at least in theory can be overcome by the use of large national registry-based ID number linked studies. Uh, and so I've, I've already mentioned, right, so the two problems with a disease like ALS, and there are a lot of other diseases, uh, I think as we progress more and more, we start looking for lower or higher and higher hanging fruit, right, diseases that are more difficult to study. Uh, and a lot of uh, the two things that a lot of these diseases have in common are that they're increasingly rare and that a lot of them are rapidly fatal. So it's very hard to collect enough individuals for both of those reasons. Not enough people get it, and then they don't have it long enough for us to recruit them into studies so that we can study the things that we'd like to. Um, but there are a few examples of this kind of work that's been done in the US, which does not, of course, have some sort of linked registry system, uh, like the Scandinavian countries. Uh, but some sort of brief examples, uh, the American Cancer Society, uh, Cancer Society recruited over one million individuals, obviously specifically for cancer research, but as good epidemiologists, we co-opted the data to look at other things, and they administered questionnaires. And in this massive cohort, it's one of the largest cohorts that's been assembled in the United States, uh, they were able to come up with just over a thousand cases of ALS. Uh, another one is the National Longitudinal, uh, Longitudinal Mortality Study, which is based <coughs> on census data and the uh, current population survey data, which is uh, related to the census. And these individuals are recruited in sort of a stratified sample every few years and then followed for their cause of death. And when they're recruited, they're administered some very basic questionnaires about their lifestyle, what kind of work they do, um, some basic health information. And in a study like that, which uh, is ongoing and it recruits every few years a representative sample from the US, 
over the case of 30 or 40 years, a study like this was able to find only 470 or so cases of ALS. Uh, and I think this is, this is one of the more interesting ones, because uh, I think a lot of future studies will make use of this. So we all know that there are a lot of cohorts that are sort of ongoing. A lot of them are here at Harvard. So the health professional study that you've probably read about, the Women's Health Initiative, the Physician's Health Study, those are the three big ones here. Uh, and so there's more and more of an effort now to pool all of these cohorts together uh, to make use of the fact that while none of them alone is large enough to study these rare diseases, if you put them together, uh, in this particular example, they were able to get up to about one million individuals, which again yielded them about 1,000 cases. All right, so these are sort of the heroic efforts that have been done in the United States to study these rare diseases. And they take a lot of time and a lot of money, and they have a lot of limitations uh, because a lot of these studies are based on cohorts that have that are not representative of the population, that have been recruited through friends and families, or the American Cancer Society mailed out questionnaires to people who donate to the American Cancer Society, which is, I would imagine, not a representative sample of the United States. Uh, and so there are a lot of problems with uh, research, uh, studies like this that rely on these cohorts. Uh, so. Jumping right into what we were doing, we uh, did our studies using the Danish um, National Registry System. Uh, and I think especially for the people at this conference, this is probably the most in interesting part, uh, which is the thing that linked all, or created our ability to uh, do any of these studies in the first place, which is the fact that Denmark has this uh, Danish ID number. They call it the CPR, and I won't try and pronounce it in Danish, uh, even though I have been learning. Uh, it was a number that was created in uh, 1968, uh, after a lot of debates following the sort of po population upheavals of World War II. They tried some things in the 50s. In 1968, they created this permanent 10-digit number, uh, which has uh, these digits uh, that have a lot of the limitations that we've heard about in these kinds of numbers. Right? So it has very identifiable information. The first seven digits are uh, specifically someone's day, month, and year of birth. There are two random numbers in there that allow it to um, uh, do certain kinds of code checking that I'm not as familiar with. Uh, and then the last digit is a, is a gender code, which is also the, code, the check code digit for the um, number itself. And so males are odd and females are even. Uh, and so if you go back and look at the debates in 1968, um, what you see in sort of the public uh, the literature and the newspapers about why they were creating this is that people were citing two reasons. Uh, first was that they just wanted more information about who was living in Denmark because they did not have a common system. And the second was for uh, a very vague uh, justification as I read it, is that they just wanted uh, something that could be used everywhere. So this CPR number, the central person uh, registration number, uh, is maintained by what in Denmark is called the civil registration system, which along with assigning these numbers and keeping these numbers for everybody, keeps a lot of uh, demographic, I would say, information on individuals. So the name, their address, place of birth, their vital status, which includes their immigration or their disappearance status. And so I think Deborah mentioned uh, something about uh, the, the residents and not just citizens should have these. And so if you're a resident in Denmark for more than three months and you, I think, own property and have a visa to stay and work, you can apply and get one of these numbers. So it's not just voting citizens. It's, it's people with a permanent residence in Denmark. And so in that point, it, it, you know, for this kind of code, somewhere in their CPR number, it would say the country that they had emigrated from into Denmark. And then other things like vital status, which includes date of death, um, cause of death in a very brief code, uh, their current marital, marital status, a job title that is sort of self-reported on their um, censuses, censuses. And then uh, what's also important for epidemiologic research is that these numbers are linked to immediate family members. Right? So for each number, it will have the number, if they exist, of the parents and the spouse and the children. And another very important thing for us um, from an epidemiologic perspective is that this data is kept historically. Right? So when marital, when marital status changes, we know the full history of the marital status. We know the dates where someone was single, where someone was married, 
where they're divorced or widowed or remarried, all of these things. So the historic data, it's not, it's not just a current snapshot of individuals. And so uh, I, uh, as part of this, I'm just going to describe some of the other data sources that we used to do this research that is all then linked by the central person register. Um, and this is just a very small snapshot of the uh, very large number of registries that exist in Denmark for research. Uh, uh, the main one that I'm talking about for this research was the pension fund, which was established in 1964, uh, which includes all wage earners and salaried employees um, because uh, beginning in the 1960s, everyone in Denmark was required to contribute, along with their employer, part of their salary to a pension that was available to them in 19, uh, at the age of 67. Right, so all paid work in Denmark is therefore captured by this database. Uh, and for, again, from the epidemiologic perspective, this is important because it contains to the day the information on where someone was working and in what kind of job that they were, they were working in. Uh, and this is sort of a technical aside, but these are classified according to sort of an internationally recognized system of classifying occupations. Right, so we can use these and compare them to other countries. There's a lim limitation here for us is that these are really, if you worked for a company, you just have that company level code. It's not occupations within the companies. Uh, another one that we've, uh, that's sort of fundamental to our, the research that we've been doing in Denmark is what's called the National Patient Register, which since 1977 uh, has been including all hospital diagnoses that have occurred within the country of Denmark. Uh, Denmark, as I think you could imagine, has a fairly uh, universal system of health coverage. I think only 1% of the hospital beds are private, and even they now are uh, required to report all diagnoses to the government. Uh, but since 1977, they've captured all in-hospital diagnoses, and since 1994, they've captured all outpatients, so sort of the clinics that you would go to that are either affiliated with a hospital um, or sort of general practitioner diagnoses. As long as a diagnosis is made, it's captured by this database. And this was initially used to monitor hospital activity and since 2000 has been used for payment, um, which people argue means that the quality of the data has gotten better since 2000 because now money is involved. So. And so the data that's kept in, these, uh, in this national patient register, because again, getting back to this idea that these are all separate data sets in theory, this is one data set that has the CPR number which can link everything together. It has the hospital department that someone was that spent time in, in the hospital, the time that they arrived, the time that they left, the, for our interests, why they were there, so the action diagnosis is what we call that. <coughs> what was it that brought them to the hospital? And then there are, are, are a host of other variables that they use, um, including sort of, were you an inpatient, were you an outpatient, did you come through the emergency room, and things like that. Uh, and so a little bit about access to data, which I think people in this room might be more interested in. Um, these data sets are all, in theory, kept by separate registries within Denmark, but uh, sort of at a level up from that, there are a few organizations. So the national, uh, the, the equivalent of the NIH in Denmark, I think it's the National Health Institute there, uh, maintains a specific health database that has a lot of the things that you would want to know if you wanted to study incidents of things that are going on in hospitals, rates changing over time, uh, similarly, uh, there's an organization which I liken to the U.S. Census Bureau uh, in a lot of ways called Statistics Denmark, uh, which maintains specific research databases that, again, have all that health information but also bring in things like occupational data that I mentioned, uh, SES, uh, data sets that track everyone's educational attainment, uh, and they make it very easy to access for research purposes. Right? So they do all the linking from these data sets which are kept in uh, various formats, the kinds of things that Deborah talked about, and they do all the linkages for you, uh, and they make these data sets available. And the access, access to these is uh, available for any research group that is pre-approved and working in Denmark. So the group that we work with there is the Danish Cancer Society. Um, it is cancer even though we're talking about ALS. There are researchers there that are interested in other diseases. And so really it's once the facility itself, the Danish Cancer Society, has access to these kinds of data sets, the other kinds of research questions that come up uh, are much easier to get, uh, to get access to these data to answer those kinds of questions. All right, so uh, 
briefly then go through a very specific example of how we used those kinds of data to answer one specific scientific question that we had, um, which was uh, whether or not uh, exposure to formaldehyde causes ALS. Right? So formaldehyde is a chemical that uh, we're all exposed to. It's, uh, I don't know, it might not be in these chairs, but it's used in sort of pressed wood. Uh, it's a solvent. It's used in um, preserving bodies. Uh, and at higher enough doses, it's a neurotoxin. And so there are some evidence from animals and from other human studies that it could cause things that look like ALS. Uh, and so what we did was uh, go to these data sets, and we found uh, all the cases of ALS that were diagnosed in Denmark between 1982 and 2009 by scanning through the patient register, which I mentioned has all the diagnoses between those years. And so you can just sort of do some sort of query in this database and say, look for all the times that this ICD code, which is the code that we use for diagnosing diseases, look for all the times that this ICD code comes up, and then for each person, find the first one, right? And so then we have the date of first diagnosis for every individual who's diagnosed with ALS in the entire country of Denmark over this 27-year period. And then for each of those people on the day that they were diagnosed with ALS, we go to the uh, the census, the, their equivalent of the census, which is, which is ongoing, and say, find me someone who looks like them in a lot of variables, so age, sex, um, and year of birth, but does not have ALS on that date. And, you, and then we can go back to the patient register to cross-check that this person doesn't have ALS. Uh, and so I assume there are probably not that many epidemiologists in the room, I'm guessing. <laughs> not my usual crowd. But, uh, What's that? Case control study. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it was a case control study. Uh, but epidemiologically, you, uh, what this means to us is that we have basically done the equivalent of following the entire population of Denmark from 1982 until 2009, all five and a half million of them at any given moment, follow them as a prospective cohort to find who develops ALS and have all their records that we would need to do an analysis. And so this is sort of just all of these things I've mentioned, this is sort of a brief layout of the way that the data is combined and sort of the data flow uh, that's used, is that these registers, as I mentioned, are kept in different uh, locations by different organizations, but they are all combined, uh, and I left it a little bit vague, by the CPR number, either by something like Statistics Denmark or the National Board of Health that creates these research data sets that are available for individuals, by linking everyone through their 10-digit CPR number. And then once we have all that information in the same data, data set, these things are de-identified and given to the researchers to use. And then we can do the things that we want to. And so in this particular case, what we did was link their occupational history uh, to uh, some data sets that let us estimate from what kind of work you do to what kind of chemicals you're exposed to, which was our ultimate scientific question. right? And then from there, we can do the analysis that we want to. And so, again, this is, I think, the weeds of the epidemiology, but basically what we can do is we have a row for each individual of the kind of job that they were doing, and we have from other outside sources, a person who's doing that kind of job is typically exposed to X amount of formaldehyde per day or per year. Right? And so we can combine these two and now get for everyone's history of occupation from 1964 onward, how much do we think, this is obviously all guesswork, how much do we think that this person would have been exposed to the chemical of interest, which for us in this case is formaldehyde? And these things exist for most countries. We have them in the U.S. for uh, various, like the uh, National Longitudinal Mortality Study, which asks a sort of a one-question thing, uh, saying, I think, what's your either most recent occupation or your major occupation? And so people have created these for different countries and different settings. Uh, but there's a very good one in the Scandinavian countries uh, that was created for Finland and then applied uh, to the rest of the uh, Nordic countries, I guess. And uh, it, yeah, so it basically lets us combine the occupation with the probability that someone in that occupation would be exposed at all, and then if they're exposed, how much would they be exposed to? And so I showed, I threw this in at the last minute, and now I'm glad I did it. What I learned now is a rectangular data set. Uh, and so this is the, this is the kind of uh, you know, just to show exactly what we're talking about, these are rows of individuals, right? So these are de-identified ID numbers. This is not their uh, CPR number that was removed, and we create these random ID numbers. 
And then across the, across the row, we have all kinds of information. So this is a bad epidemiologist. I forget what sex one means. <laughs> it either means male or female. <laughs> uh, the, their year of birth, the year that uh, this person was diagnosed with ALS, which was 26th of January, 1983, uh, and various things. So 1983 was the year they were diagnosed. And then it, this, was, this is cut off there, I think 100 or 200 more rows that captures how much um, variables like this, this X sub J, is basically saying how much do you think this person was exposed to formaldehyde in that year, in that given year. And there are other variables that would say all the years before this, how much do we think someone was exposed to formaldehyde. And so this is sort of the holy grail a little bit of the kind of data that we can get by linking all these data sets, right, which gives us, uh, and I'll explain this, this is a, a plot of all 365,000 Danes that we have in our data set, uh, split by whether or not they have ALS, so the, the pink, which is a little bit hard to see on this, the pink, which is peeking out here, are the people with ALS, the greenish, turquoise-ish, uh, are the healthy controls. But from this kind of data, we can estimate for each individual, and then this is a histogram, a smoothed histogram, of how much formaldehyde we, were th we think that they were exposed to over their occupational history. Right. And this looks very close, but actually to an epidemiologist, this looks uh, like there's a big difference to us. Because any anytime there's the cases are peeking out at least a little bit to the right, it looks like to us ALS is associated with and exposure to these kinds of things. But the ability to create this kind of plot itself is sort of what these kinds of registries and this linkage allows us to do. Uh, and this is, uh, and this is sort of the typical kinds of results that we represent based on that last slide, which is to say now we can lump people into their groups. How much formaldehyde were they exposed to in terms of quartiles, so the lowest to the highest quartiles of formaldehyde exposure, and then we can calculate their odds or their risk of developing ALS based on those exposure levels. This is uh, not published yet, so. <laughs> uh, and somewhat preliminary, but as you can see, right, it looks to us like there's a slightly elevated risk of, exp of ALS following exposure to formaldehyde. All right, so the purposes of this is not to show these results per se, but just the kinds of things that goes, that comes out of this long process of linking these data sets and the kinds of information that we can get on each individual level uh, to calculate these things that we, in the end, want to do, which is relative risks for epidemiologists, relative odds of disease. Uh, and so that was sort of one example of a fairly simple and small project that we did. There are a lot of other things that we're working on, just to give you a flavor of, specifically in the Danish data set, what's possible. And I think this is very similar to what could be done in Swedish data sets or Norwegian uh, or Icelandic. Uh, things that we've already done is look at medical history. so whether or not people have had head trauma before their diagnosis of ALS, um, what kinds of drugs they've been taking throughout their entire life, whether or not those things pre uh, predispose individuals to ALS. Um, I think looking, going forward, some of the more exciting things will be combining residential information with other data sets that can estimate how much air pollution exists at certain locations. Right, so either air pollution itself or proxies that we use, which is how far do you live from a major roadway, which you know, predicts how much uh, car exhaust that you breathe in, or distance from industrial sites. Uh, and two other important ones are these, the idea of linking individuals to people that they're related to, either just family or siblings, and that can be done fairly easily in the Danish data set because the mother's CPR includes all of her children, so we can link individ individuals at least through their mother, right, so either half or full siblings. Uh, and then twin studies, which is a slightly different issue, but all of the Scandinavian countries have uh, been doing for at least 30 or 40 years registries of every twin that's born uh, is sort of thrown into this data set because they know that there are obvious uh, benefits in terms of research uh, when it comes to twins. And so in these data sets, it includes things like the CPR, which can then be linked back to all this other kind of data. All right, so just to wrap up briefly what uh, I think from our perspective using this Danish data is what the, the benefits of um, a registry that can be linked with a national ID number uh, is that, it, uh, and again, this is really from the epidemiologic research perspective, is that it allows for full follow-up right, <coughs> for a well-defined cohort. So we really did, in, a, in an epidemiologic sense, follow all five and a half million people who were alive in Denmark in 1982 until 2009 for all cases of ALS that developed. There's really no other way to do that 
unless th these registries exist that can then be linked back to important exposure data. From our perspective, it's important that these, these kinds of data are prospectively collected, right? So when someone develops the disease, it's recorded relatively quickly. It's not that we find a group of people and then we ask them what happened th to them before. Because these things are not necessarily created for research purposes, often for tax purposes or pension purposes, they are created as they go because the government needs real-time data. That's a major benefit from an epidemiologic standpoint because we don't have to worry about errors that people have in remembering things. Right? So if, if we can remove that kind of error, that's a major research benefit. Obviously, there's a variety of data sources. I showed, I guess, three, four here. There are many others that we haven't used or some that we want to, some that we don't even know about. We're still learning about um, things like uh, wealth databases, um, uh, uh, educational databases. Uh, and so I think, and a lot of people think from the world of epidemiology, is that the best work is going to do these kinds of things and then combine it with more traditional epidemiologic work, right, which involves interviewing people to get the kind of information that you want that might not be captured by a registry. Right? So I glossed a little bit over the limitations of these things, but right, so whether or not someone is a smoker or whether or not someone consumes a lot of certain kinds of foods <coughs> is obviously not going to be captured by most registries, but by sort of combining what we call traditional epidemiologic investigations with all this data that is being captured in a sense passively by these registries from our perspective, uh, I think it's going to allow a lot of uh, much better research in the future. All right, and uh, I would just like to thank, uh, first of all, the Rose Traveling Fellowship, uh, which allowed me to go to Copenhagen and do some of this research there. So thank you, Deborah. Uh, uh, <laughs> and again, this wouldn't be possible legally uh, without uh, colleagues working in Denmark. Uh, and so we worked with people at the Danish Cancer Society, in particular Johnny Hansen. Uh, and then, you know, the rest is there. Thank you. Wonderful uh, research. Thanks so much, Ryan. Uh, Jackie, do we have a few minutes for questions? Do we have a few minutes for to take questions from? Okay. All right. So, um, if you have questions for the for the panel, kindly raise your hand, state your affiliation, state a question, uh, and then whether it is for a single panelist or for the whole group. Yes. Ah, and wait for the mic. No, I think it's because it's being recorded. Thank you. Hello, uh, Northeastern University, Priska Castaner. Uh, I'm a professor in economics. And my question is actually for Joanne. Um, uh, I uh, hold a green card myself. And I was wondering if um, the US would actually um, consider, um, follow that model, uh, in order to give an ID to everybody, because a green card has your biometrics, has your signature, has your photo photograph, and has a number ID. Um, the green card, that, that discussion has actually taken place, and, and I've, I've had that discussion with, in various areas um, when I was commissioner. And the issue is that basically the feeling is the green card has a very specific meaning. Um, and that um, when you talk about giving it to everyone, are you talking about giving it to U.S. citizens or to... Yeah, the format. Yeah. yeah the, and yes, and you could do that, but the issue is um, when you receive a green card, the number of people who have green cards is very small relative, obviously, to the whole population of people who would be enumerated under an ID system or an ID card. And so that, that doesn't, following that model does not alleviate the financial costs that I mentioned, the $9 billion a year and the need for the infrastructure. Whether we use the post office, let's add one more thing so it takes an hour to buy stamps instead of 30 minutes, you know, with the passport <laughs> stuff going on there now. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, there are certain kinds of infrastructure, or, you know, d dare say we use a bank or something and then we're privatizing the system because, I mean, I'm just telling you, you know, I, I, I say these things, Deborah, because I know that you had politics and that is one of the three things. Very, very important to always keep that in mind because, you know, the, the, the the political politics, it's a, it, these issues play out in a dynamic landscape, and 
politics plays a very real part in creating that dynamic effect. So what I'm saying is you could look at that, but that's kind of what we looked at when we came up with the cost of doing it. But you still have to have the ability to do the photographs and all that kind of stuff. The other thing is, little known thing, the social security card, which I've already admonished this group not to carry with you, and keep it in a safe place at home. When, you know, <laughs> um, actually has many security features built into it, which I am not at liberty to discuss because they're top secret, seriously. Um, and I'm sure so that someone from Social Security would you know, beat me about the face and head if I divulge that. But seriously, it is actually a way more secure card than people realize. Um, and so one of the issues with the green card is it's very easy to duplicate quite frankly, using a model like that. One of the real, 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 real thorny issues is figuring out what kind of card can you come up with that is actually very difficult, if not impossible, to duplicate. Because as soon as we do something like this, you know there will be an industry, a cottage, illegal cottage industry, that will be reproducing the ID cards and manufacturing them and have them on the street, my guess is within a week of such a card, and that's probably a long time, the way things are today. Um, so even though people think that they create a social security card, actually upon close scrutiny and using the appropriate document examination technology, looking through certain things, you can tell very quickly that it's not a real card. These other cards are much easier, like green cards, to duplicate. Yes. Thank you. Louise. Oh, uh, maybe wait for the uh, the microphone. Thank you, Louis Drucker, Harvard Humanitarian Initiative um, affiliated expert. I'm coming back to Deborah uh, and your presentation uh, on age. Um, having worked uh, at UNHCR for 30 years, spending six years with the Vietnamese, and it was a very big issue: the unaccompanied minors, whom uh, uh, who got an, a preferential state, uh, status if they could confirm their age below 18. But many, it was very evident that they were more than 18, and uh, it was really hard to deal with them. So in, on one of your slides, you deal with refugees and migration populations. Could you imagine that um, your knowledge uh, could be applied for... Uh, organization, and we have Andrew Hopkins here uh, in charge of uh, registration from UNHCR and speaking tomorrow, that uh, we could benefit from your knowledge and experience, also from yours, Joanne and Ryan, uh, if you have a comment on that. Thank you. Um, mine is only um, some kind of anthropology in terms of life events in small communities, and looking at the age estimate for the National Health Interview Survey. I was part of the um, move to computerize it, um, but that was when computerizing was easier. Um, um, and I noticed that there are things like, are you a veteran, and which war did you serve in? How old was your mother? You know, How old are your siblings? Um, I, is there anyone from India who can talk about how they go back to the villages to estimate age for birth certificates? for people who have gotten odd heart numbers. Um, it's actually pretty complex. I mean, I, I, I'm not an expert in it at all, but I can you know, point you to sources, and I'd be happy to work with it. Is there anyone else here who has a background in that? There's a microphone coming. Uh, uh, in India, when we uh, enroll for Aadhaar, uh, we do ask for uh, date of birth from the residents. Uh, so there are two possibilities. The resident uh, may have a formal uh, uh, proof of birth, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, birth certificate. So in that case, we do note the exact date of birth. And we also make a record that this date of birth is verified. But we also recognize that uh, lots of people may not have any formal uh, birth certificate. So in that case, what we uh, ask the resident that can you tell me the date of birth, or if you don't know the date of birth, then maybe approximate age. And then whatever the date of birth or the age the resident mentions, we take it. And in our record, in Aadhaar record, 
we say this is the uh, date of birth claimed and unverified. So this is how. So we have a date of birth, uh, you know, two classification, verified and unverified. Thank you. That's probably all the time that we have. Uh, so please uh, join me in thanking our panelists for their presentations. Thank you.